Welcome back to Is That How They See Me? Part four of this five part series. So in the first three parts, we have discussed the idea of mass society and mass culture and how it has potentially changed the way that humans experience life and behave, as well as the idea of semiotics and the signifiers, the carriers of meaning, what these meaning, meanings may represent depending upon the cultural codes that we share and how the producers have a preferred meaning that they want us to walk away with. And we as the audience interpret and make sense of these meanings in our own particular way. In the second part of the series, we discuss the idea ideas of hegemony and ideology, hegemony being the uh, relationship of power between the haves and the have-nots and how um, certain, certain values, beliefs, and ways of life are naturalized through media representation and the reinforcement of the content that we are exposed to. Uh, and likewise, the ideology and how we build concept of self and others uh, through experience of media content and what we see represented about those that are similar to us or those that are con uh, uh, different than us. Um, next, we discuss the the identities of masculinity and femininity, femininity, and how certain messages presented in media may represent or give us the natural state of order of what we expect a man or a woman to look and behave like. And so, in this fourth part of the series, well, I'd like to explore the concept of sex and sexuality as it relates to media content and images and what is reinforced or what we walk away with potentially um, through content and messages sex sales, especially when it comes to media content. I often uh, ask uh, my classes when we get into discussion about media content, what are the most prevalent things that we find being readily available in, in, in media and representations in film, videos, music productions, etc. And usually it's violence and sex. There's a reason that violence and sex find their ways into media content so easily. A lot of scholars suggest that violence is easy to make sense of. It's easy to interpret. You don't have to know language. You don't have to necessarily know a particular culture in which you're functioning in. When you see some being, somebody being punched, you understood that person just was punched. Or if they're stabbed or shot, you recognize they were just shot or stabbed. Likewise, with sex, it's easy to interpret. It's easy to make sense of. If you see someone giving someone a kiss or a flirtatious look, it's usually very easily understood, regardless of whatever language you speak or depending upon what culture or experience you have. Sex is something that's easy to interpret. So if we look at this context of sex, and especially in media content, research has demonstrated that music videos in particular are riddled with attitudes and beliefs about gender and sexuality in particular. And if we look at some of these photos that I have presented on this slide, you'll see a variety of music genres, but yet sex is greatly embedded in each one of them. the far left. That is an image of a country music video um, by an artist, I believe it's Trace Atkins, and the title of the song is Honky Tonk but Donkey Donk. So he's going through the course of this song in this video talking about he wants to be with a girl or hang out with a girl that has certain body parts that are very appealing to him um, in terms of that honky tonk, the donkey donk. And as you notice in this particular representation of the video, the women are very sexualized all around. It's him and nothing but women dressed erotically, dancing very sensually, etc. And then the video, the photo that is right next to that one is a classic rock and roll video, uh, White Snake, Here I Go Again. The actress's name is Tawny Katan. And the fix of a lot of young men that grew up in the 80s and 90s that watched this video repeatedly and saw this woman doing very eroticized performances on top of vehicles and cars as well as well as interacting with the lead singer for the White Snake um, rock group. Moving on to the video, the photo next to that one is a video, more recent one of Rihanna. I believe the song is Pour It Up. This whole very video is very erotic and, and fetishizes the woman's female body and is, is geared towards or, uh, sexual orientation. As you see the way she's sitting, what she's dressed in, and then if you look in, in the distance behind her, there is a person, uh, I'm pretty sure that is a woman, that is performing on a pole. A lot of sexual orientation um, and thoughts are connected to the idea of a woman and pole dancing and then the the photo to the far right is a picture of uh, Britney Spears performing among a group of other women very scantily clad sexualized type of dance moves being uh, conducted in the midst of this performance so if we continue to look at this idea of mainstreaming sex there's a phrase that is often associated with um, research and scholarship that is dedicated to mainstream media and sex and in particular sex in relationship to power the American Psychological Association um, walks us through this 
uh, the definition and I did, I understanding of this phrase sexualization and APA designates sexualization as something that happens to women and girls. And so if we take it in this consideration that sexualization is something that happens to one particular um, group within our, pop, our population, within our society, we realize then that sexualization is a byproduct of power relationships. And it is the manner, a matter of men, the male gaze, sexualizing the female figure and fetishizing the, what it is to ex expect sex or a sexuality out of a woman. And so we take it a step further, we come to acknowledge that sexualization is a saturation of sexual representation and discourses. So if we're talking about a saturation, it means that we cannot escape the direction that we're looking at. Sex is going to be in our face. And more often than not, what researchers and scholars are suggesting to us, the manner in which uh, sex is demonstrated to us is in a pornographic frame. And it's increasingly porous and influential throughout our society to a point in which mainstream contemporary culture has pornified excuse me, um, within the representations of sex that we've become accustomed to. As you'll look at the two images here, one is an advertisement for Dolce & Gabbana in which you have four men overpowering or look to be overpowering one woman in a very sexualized stance, one man dominating directly over her and the other three men looking. Another one is of a performance by the artist Miley Cyrus in which she is on stage and performing and in doing so, she's to a point revealing a portion of her breast and leaves you to wonder how far did she go in terms of this and was it necessary for the performance that she is giving in this in this regard. I'll reserve some of this in regards to the pornography of mainstream culture as well as the artist's artist connection to this pornography or sexualization of self um, as I reintroduce it in a couple more slides. If we look at sexualization further, there are four particular areas in which certain scholars challenge us to appreciate this, this phenomenon of sexualization. One, a person val person's value comes from her sexual appeal and not from other characteristics. So a person that does not deem themselves to quote unquote be sexy according to westernized society's traditions and norms will not value themselves as much as another as the, the woman that she sees and, and demonstrates sexuality as it is understood. So if I'm a little bit overweight, if my breasts are not big enough, if my, my buttocks is not large enough, then I am not sexually appealing in, 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 in the traditional norm and, and ways in which we consider sexual opinion so my value is demeaned second a person's attractiveness is inextricably linked with her sexual appeal so in order for me to be sexually appealing and in order for me to be attractive i have to be appealing sexually to the other sex i have to have that kind of presence that they deem to be worthy of sexuality. And if not, then I must not be a physically attractive person. And if I'm not a physically attractive person, then how can I demonstrate, how can I produce that level of sexual appeal? Third, a person is sexually objectified, made into a thing for other sexual use. So when we sexualize a person, particularly a woman, no longer do we see a human being standing for, before us and, and, or presented to us. Instead, we see a sexual object, something that is to be used for a very particular purpose and then discarded or disregarded and paid no attention to beyond that specific purpose. Again, going back to the idea of the value that a person may have, not only for themselves, but within our society at large. And then lastly, a person has sexuality inappropriately opposed upon them. So more often than not, when we talk about sexualization, we are also looking at putting people that do not need to be sexualized. And this often comes into play when we present young women, women of a, a age much younger than what we consider adulthood into a frame in which they are sexualized. I'll reserve a little bit of this because I revisit this particular attribute in a few more slides as well. But you get the general sense that sometimes we do sexualize someone we are sexualizing and we're using sexual sexuality in an inappropriate manner. Now, there is the argument that some artists, some performers self-sexualize. And so the images that you see to the right are, are considered some of these artists that demonstrate self-sexualization in which they see themselves as being empowering. They are taking control of their sexuality as, a, as opposed to having someone telling them how to demonstrate sexuality or what sexuality is. So self-sexualization becomes this reflection or this concept or idea 
of self-powering through sexuality. Um, Nicki Minaj, Lizzo, Miley Cyrus, all demonstrating in some way, shape or form in which they say, I am taking this power and utilizing it for myself as opposed to having society tell me what is or is not sexual or if I am not sexual. Now, some would argue or contrast this, this concept of sex, self-sexualization and suggest that this this move or this this approach to self-sexualization is actually a choice that girls and women are making in order to conform to the norms of westernized society and the traditions of hegemonic uh, dominance in, in a manner of what is sexy in a culture in order to get rewards. So you may be claiming to take control of your sexuality and your, your sexiness, but you're doing it in a manner that is going to reap benefit for you. And so th th this idea of control may be a false premise of control and as a uh, is conforming to the expectations of a hegemonic society. So coming back to this idea of inappropriately designating sex on someone, this comes into this idea of hypersexualization where um, there is a moral panic or a fear about sexualization and hypersexualization through media content in which we inappropriate sexualize young girls. Um, you see demonstrated by these performances of a young, young group of little girls, young ladies on stage, and they're doing some sort of looks like burlesque type of performance and they're wearing, you know, scantily clad clothing, what some may consider. And look at this as the sexualization of young girls, girls that we deem not ready for sexuality and understanding sex and being introduced to sex. Very similar with the picture of the little girl that's sitting off to the to the left hand side of the screen where she has this look that obviously has makeup on, has on clothing that would be probably designated for adulthood and definitely has a gaze or a stare to the camera in which we as the audience have a voyeuristic look gazing back at her and this gaze between she and the audience becomes very flirtatious, very seductive. And so there's a fear, and a moral panic amongst some of society about the hypersexualization and especially of young girls and young women that we are objectifying them to a sense that is very inappropriate. So coming back to this concept of pornification, so when we think about the hypersexualization of society through media content images, and this, this there is a fear or concern that much of mainstream culture, especially in music videos, but as well in television and film and other dynamics, has been porn. More and more porno discourse is finding itself embedded into mainstream culture and, and performances, and, and porn, pornographic discourse is having potentially an influence on the a sexual identity and the development of you. And so we now see what is considered a normalization of pornography embedded in mainstream, uh, mainstream uh, popular culture and mainstream performances to the point in which it's sometimes sexually explicit content is presented on readily available images and concepts that, that youth are engaged with. As such, there's become no chic styling. And basically this gets into the idea that the aesthetic that we see uh, performed in mainstream uh, media, film, television, music videos, and then also finding itself permeating out into society at large has a particular aesthetic to it, a particular fashion. And so there's this hyper -fem femininity that is part of porno chic styling in which the fashion of this is to be dressed in stiletto heels, to have worn heavy sets of makeup. Um, so now now, in terms of what it is to be considered sexy and to be appealing and to be a woman is this idea that it is very closely related to a fashion esteem or aesthetic that would be found in a pornographic film or video. There's this hypersexuality of the porno chic styling in which the body is exposed and perhaps some would suggest overly exposed, especially in particular areas of the body, emphasizing the, the hip, hip area, the buttocks, the breast and cleavage showing. And then lastly, in this porno chic styling, there's the idea that perpetual, perpetually sexually desiring natures are demonstrated in, 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 a, in, a, in a manner in which the person, particularly the woman, is always performing or seeing as if they are quote unquote up for it, it of course being sex. They are always ready prepared for any sexual encounter that may come along their way. Now, of course, some of you may, if it's about power, can the male body be sexualized? 
And of course, there's the idea in regards to uh, creating a normalization of what the male body should look like. As you see the images of Chris Evans here, one in which he's very cut and ripped and another one in which he's, you know, got his muscular tone going, but not as necessarily ripped. But at no point do you necessarily see like flab going on in his body. And there is the idea that the male body is expected to look and perform in a particular way. And so if, the, if you interact or engage with a male body that does not look like this, then that leads one to question the masculinity and the sexuality of that particular male body. But I think that the true question gets to it's not sexualization if that body is not subjected to a, a, considerable, amount, a considerable amount of power influence. And thus, arguably, the male body is less prone, especially the white male body is less prone to be sexualized. It may deem to be sexy. It may be deemed to be attractive, but the, sexualiza the sexualization and the objectification of the male body is what comes into question. And it's more often than not going to be the case that the white male body is not sexual sexualized in the same way that the female body is sexualized. Now, keeping in mind, again, if it's about power, can the male body be sexualized? There are other means and ways in which a male body can be sexualized, as we've seen demonstrated with the ethnic racial other. We'll see in the African-American community in the late 70s going into the 80s, there were the black exploitation films that would take place and often sexualizing both the black male body and the black female body. So there was sexual exploitation taking place in regards to the male body, the ethnic racial body of the African-American man and woman woman, commodification, earning profit, revenue off the sexual exploitation of those bodies, stereotypings of what it was to be a, a shaft or a Mac. He's a bad mother. Shut your mouth. All the women want him or her. Look at the Mac. Women are all around him grabbing at his body and appreciating him. And of course, ideologies of promiscuity. If you see the other one, Cleopatra Jones starring uh, Pam Greer, a series of films by her in which her body is arguably sexually exploited and demonstrated to be sexually uh, promiscuous in regards to interacting and engaging in sexual behaviors. Uh, likewise, for the Latin male and female body, there's an eroticizing and a tropicalizing of the, of the Latin male and female body in which we see certain performances that equate with our hegemonic expectations of what this group and culture of people do with sexual behavior. But if we talk about sexualization of the other body as well, the ethnic racial other body, we also have to take in consideration there are ethnic racial uh, populations that are desexualized. If we take into consideration the Asian, Asian male body, not very often do we see um, sexual behavior performed by the Asian male body. And I have a particular um, photos at the bottom of the screen here from the movie Romeo Must Die starring Jet Li and Aaliyah. And it's interesting because these are the two uh, lead characters within this film, but at no point is there really any true sexual interaction or flirtation between these two. Um, it is very interesting because if we look at this film, if you, you would expect for a film of this nature to have some sort of kissing scene, some sort of romantic scene between the lead characters, but nowhere in this film is it of that nature. And it's very common for the Asian male body pe to be desexualized in mainstream film and, and, and television uh, production. So going back to that statement, sex sales, again, another statement that I give to just about every class that I teach or instruct that deals with media theory or media and culture. And we get into a conversation, the sex sale. We start talking about what type of sex we see on in mainstream um, film and television performances. What does it look like? Who's traditionally in it? And at some point in the conversation, we start to realize that most of the sex that quote unquote sales is heteronormative sex. It's, it's sex between a man and a woman. So we start to ask ourselves, does all sex sell equally. Um, and if, if not, what sex do we not? And so we ask ourselves, if sex sells, then why is it that we do not see all sex selling in mainstream um, film? The photo that you see at the bottom of the screen here is from the television series Batwoman. A little bit of a spoiler alert if you have not seen this yet. The main character is um, homosexual and it's actually part of the storyline, the overarching storyline through the narrative of the story. And so on a number of occasions, you see the main character interacting with a partner in a sexual be in a sexual nature. So here we are in the 21st century and we're engaging in media in different ways, especially digital media, social media platforms, and the idea of gender 
and identity are at a crossroads. They're, they're being blurred and definitely the same with sexual. People are actively negotiating and performing sexual identities in new, new manners in constructing who they see themselves to be or how they think they see themselves to be in the world through profiles and avatars online. And so it's, it's interesting when I look at this particular uh, image of a online avatar of a young, and then I think, is this actually even a woman potentially that has created this avatar? It could easily be a man. And this avatar represents how he sees himself as a, in terms of gender identity and even sexual identity. So Ed, I ask you to challenge yourself in this 21st century, as you engage with media content and images, how are you utilizing it to demonstrate your sexuality? How are you utilizing it to understand or make sense of sexuality and how we engage with sexual behavior, whether as a young man or as a young woman, as a mature man or a mature woman, how is it that media has played a role in your understanding of gender and sexuality and its role in our lives and our behaviors? So of course, I thank you for joining me for part four of this five-part series. I look forward to concluding the series with the next edition of this seminar, and we will be discussing socioeconomic status as it's presented to us in various media content.